we often train our PhD students in our own image, that is for a life in academia. But the truth is that just like uh, there's a paucity of core jobs for bachelor students, there is a paucity of academic jobs for all PhD students. It's a truth all across the globe. Maybe less so in India compared to the US, but India is fast ca catching up to that grim picture where there is a huge difference between the number of PhD graduates every year and the number of academic jobs, like good academic jobs in respectable institutes uh, that are available. So is it not perhaps time for us to maybe tune our training and supervision of PhD students in such a way that they can be better prepared for a life in the industry? Yes, I, I strongly believe so. In fact, uh, in very, when I, I ask my students as well here that, okay, what do you want to do after this? When they first enter, they all want to do, uh, you know, they're always, they want to pursue a career in academia. I'll do a PhD. Everyone here, wants to a become PhD. a professor after one, after doing a PhD. Yeah. All right, I want to do, so that's what they come with. But slowly, I think it's our duty also to expose them to industrial research, to people in, in, the, in industrial R&D, so that they get a feel of that. Okay, not all of us probably will, it is not possible for someone to work on an industrial R&D project because sometimes those come with their own uh, with their own constraints, you may not be allowed to publish, etc. So your main PhD problem can be something, but if there are some side problems that uh, you can give to the student to work on additionally, uh, trust me, that is going to help a lot. Okay, and uh, then about I the big picture, seen, I have seen students, uh, my seniors, uh, so who have done a very academic kind of PhD, but did end up going to uh, to industry. So exactly. So the uh, so there's always I, a question of of uh, which skills are transferable and how the students is able to apply himself in those uh, kind of skills. So I'll, I'll I'll tell you a story, rather interesting one. My my first interview, twenty years back, um, I, at Intel, <clears throat> I went in and then there was this senior person who later on became a very close friend and one of and, and mentor. Uh, he's also a very accomplished researcher. Uh, his name is Ravi Prashar. Okay, yes. So I think he I has given you a testimony on your LinkedIn profile, I think. Correct. So I sat down with Ravi. Uh, so first thing is he said that mm, I'm, going to, I'm going to conduct a technical interview. Okay. And then in the half an hour, one question after the other, okay, he, would, he would write something on his notebook and say, what is this? What is this? What is this? And most of the times I was... I didn't know what I was, what I was answering. Most of the, most of the questions I couldn't answer. Even if some of the answers, which I thought I gave correctly, he, he had no expression on his face. He said, okay, let's move on. Let's move on to the next one, which he said two questions, which I could not answer, which, I, which he said, which, which was his reaction to questions, which I could answer. So I had no idea how I did. And my own impression was I did extremely poorly. Okay. I could hardly answer anything. And after that, you know, interviews are a little different over there. Mm and in industry overall is it was a I was a fresh PhD student I had an interview starting at 8 a.m which ended at 5 p.m starting with some in interactions with the hiring manager followed by a seminar and then followed by a bunch of one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, across across the board and because I was it was a recession time even people at the level of VP came down to interview me okay so after Ravi's interview I just kept it. I, I, I took it very lightly because I thought that I, anyway, <laughs> this is a job I'm not going to get. I majorly goofed up. Then I got the job. And I asked him that, uh, was, how could you hire me after that performance? He said, no. And in fact, I came to know that he was the person who was actually championing me. There was another candidate whom many people thought was better than me. But uh, Ravi really fought for me and got me the job. Okay. By the way, that other person was apparently from Stanford, was, was from Stanford University. Okay. Uh, so you can see that how much Ravi had to fight to get somebody uh, to <laughs> get somebody ahead of a Stanford grad, PhD graduate. So anyway, I asked him later that how could you hire me? He said, uh, I could hardly answer. He said, I was not looking for answers. I was looking for uh, your thought process. I was, I was looking at how you are attacking these problems. Some of the, some of the questions I don't expect anybody to know the answers or maybe very few people to know the answers. But what I was trying to see is whether what you, I was trying to examine your train of thoughts 
and and your way of attacking a problem okay so why i took this personal example is i want to i again i again repeat that phd is an education it's not about solving working on a particular problem and publish writing a thesis it's this quality that you have to pick up as to how to attack a problem with an unknown solution in a systematic manner breaking it up and going to a certain level so ravi was actually examining to what level i could go and from there he would move on to the next question okay and he tried that on a variety of problems to see that whether i am able to show this because some questions may be in my domain and i may know but some questions i may not know so he was he was trying all that this this is what he told me later probably okay. he was also so, testing you on your flexibility to context switch absolutely and and how how far what what the same industry does a term can you think on your feet yes okay and this is one i i i throw something because and and you have to you have to think and and come up either with a decision or or a, or a method and can you do that do you have you developed that capability so that is something and also i i have i'll tell you also uh, that you know i have seen especially in india several phd students stellar cv in terms of publications or even background but uh, you know when it came to questions just outside his immediate problem they faltered okay that 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 ex we expected somebody with with a sound fundamental understanding to answer you, most people faltered there okay so that cannot happen when you are going to an industry you are not going to work on what you work uh, on on your phd problem in your post doc yes post doc if somebody is looking for a post doc he would that would be for a certain project and that professor would be looking for someone who has worked in a similar field so that that person can come and start giving output right away industry is going to put you on on his on its own problem okay so you should develop this capability to work on problems with unknown solutions okay that's industrial r and d uh, very recently one of my phd students is going to defend next friday he he is right now working mahindra electric mobility okay mahindra electric mobility particularly working on battery technologies and probably motors and all you know what was his phd on his phd was on numerical modeling of pool boiling heat transfer using something called lattice boltzmann method absolutely no relation to what he is doing in his job today why did mahindra hire him okay they tested him they went he went through three four rounds of interviews and then they hired him and i think that's because, the norm here in india right three four rounds of interview for phd students yeah absolutely yeah. in industry that's the norm yeah because they were testing his his skills the skills that he has which is the transferable skills does he have an analytical mind can he attack an unknown problem and if that is there a person can be successful anywhere and does he have the basic fundamental knowledge in that area which is in our case primarily fluid mechanics heat transfer thermodynamics etc and so that's what he's got and solid mechanics solid, and solid mechanics especially <laughs> yes yeah and after that electrochemistry for battery etc he can pick up because he has shown that ability to pick up a new area and 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 uh, showing results and i was talking to him and we were again discussing this and he said another thing that worked on is they figured out that he had good coding skills because when he was writing his own codes on lattice boltzmann method using matlab etc they figured out that he knows coding and he knows use of matlab these are also transferable skills so it's Remember? great that you brought this point up so one of uh, one of the students actually asked this very specific question that uh, he is doing his phd work writing his own cfd codes uh, uh, so is there any possibility of such kind of jobs in the industry i told you an told you an example yeah. right away yeah. and even when you are using standard packages etc you most of the complex problems you have to write your own user defined functions right, right? okay so there are jobs and for example to be asked if you ask me i cannot code today okay i that's that's my limitation as my incompetence i i could but i have not most of the times i use packages as a black box okay i i define a geometry i put boundary conditions i get results okay and whether the results are meaningful or not maybe through experience i have gathered some knowledge to figure out what is what is good result what is what is uh, junk but what is this but the software that the package the tool like a fluent or an or an ice pack or a flow therm or an ansys or an abacus these are these are black boxes for me to be honest 
but someone who has the capability to actually write these codes etc is extremely valuable and this is a transferable skill today or okay so these and, are some uh, of the things so i i just like to mention here because you mentioned code uh, and i do like coding a little bit not as much as one of these whiz kids uh, in their third and fourth years but i do like coding a little bit uh, so nowadays the buzzword is python so everyone and in fact in that vbox report also it was explicitly mentioned that in the very immediate future python coding would be something which would be given importance by the industry now usually when people think about python now it is this kids they basically think of data science right but much before i mean when uh, when they were kids uh, in school and didn't have to worry about jobs or anything these is very same kids back then when we were students so i learned that uh, python is like the scripting language for a very important uh, software package called abacus which is of extreme importance in uh, solid mechanics and even in other domains uh, overall in mechanical engineering uh, and Uh, the kind of scripting that you learn in python can actually be uh, cross purposed uh, across a number of different domains uh, you have uh, open source packages uh, uh, python 11 packages where the scripting is done in python so if a person learns python there is an actual uh, possibility of contributing in very hard code engineering uh, applications also absolutely absolutely even even ai ml also you know uh, yeah one part of ai ml is what we hear but uh, even otherwise in in, uh, in in areas like diagnostics etc ai ml is becoming important absolutely okay. so uh, so these are see these are tools these are techniques these are skills you can apply on various areas in fact you brought out they brought, brought you brought up data science yeah data science data analytics can be used for engineering problems uh, and and can give some very meaningful insights okay and in fact if you have a very core knowledge in a technical domain coupled with the knowledge in data science that's a killer combination okay Absolutely. because because you can work in a core industry and you bring in a skill set which is absolutely unique which is going to differentiate you from the others okay right. and and maybe that is also something i want to uh, people who work uh, after working in the industry for some time and after reaching a certain level of seniority you have to ask yourself that what is my differentiating feature which makes me valuable and unique to this company okay every person is unique every person is special and you have to create your own identity in your organization if this is the area mr x is the person to go to a few years down the road not immediately nobody expects you as a fresh graduate to to attain that but maybe 5 7 10 years down the road that's what you should you would like to attain see progression in terms of positions levels designations will happen automatically okay but this is what you have to work, work towards